All right. I think I'm ready to go here. Uh, as uh, the introduction said, my name is Tarek Lubeni, and I'm going to be talking about the development of a medical device that we worked on in the Gaza Strip um, under fire. And I'll explain what that all means. Here's all my contact information. Please don't hesitate to contact me. Also, don't hesitate uh, to share it as needed with whomever you please. By way of introduction, not of who I am, but what I do, I am a emergency physician. Um, that's probably not what an emergency physician would ever look like, but these are the photos one finds of doctors. I don't even know what the hell he's listening to, but anyway. <laughs> Back? All right, there. It'll come back again. Don't worry, don't worry. I'm not that hard to find. Okay. Uh, and also, of course, the most important uh, part of this is that medicine needs tools, and so I'm heavily involved in medical device work. So I want to start by just addressing one of the key problems in this work, which is that it seems often that medicine is, here, just a sec, let me. Hmm. I'm now missing a part of my screen. Let's, let's see if we can get this back here. Okay, well, I think I can try this one last time. Oh, there we go. It seems very often as though medicine is quite abstract. And one of the things that I realized in my work is that medicine, and especially this kind of work, is deeply, deeply intimate. This is a man who's walking in a sniper scope, which is the bulk of my work at this moment in time. And as you can see, the sniper watches him, traces him, becomes one with him. Before it is that he finally gets to shoot, he has to so intimately become connected with him that he has to even understand when his victim breathes. There's nothing abstract. People are not killed a thousand at a time in a place like Palestine. They're killed one by one, one bullet at a time. That is my problem. That is what I have to deal with. And so he holds his breath, watches carefully, and then when the time comes, shoots. Yes! Then he says, I'm on the other side of that sniper scope. Not me individually every time, us, people who provide medical care in these situations. And we never forget that intimacy because we have to pick people up off the ground one by one too. I'm going to take you through a very quick history of the conflict. It starts for us as far as we're concerned in 2006, Hamas 
a group that's been designated as a terror group by uh, many countries in the world wins an election. Countries like Canada and everybody else, Canada was the first, and that's where I live and work right now most of the year, uh, cut them off. A coup is launched, and Hamas wins the coup. The blockade is brutal. The blockade is complete. It allows nothing in and nothing out. Things like coriander, chocolate, and of course medical supplies, though they're unintended victims of, of blockade, do not arrive. There's a war in 2008, a war in 2012, a war in 2014. And throughout all of these wars, people die. A lot of people die. And when we finally would sit and calculate the statistics, what we found is that people died because they weren't able to have the equipment that they needed. They weren't able to have the devices that were required. Of the 2,200 people who died in the war in 2014, about half of them died of what we affectionately call limb exsanguination. That is to say, one or more of their arms or legs was shot and they bled from it. And when they did, uh, about half of them took half an hour to die. In medical terms, that should never happen. Nobody should ever die from limb exsanguination when it takes half an hour. That is a treatable injury. What we were told, basically, and what everyone told me is that, well, Tarek, there's the predator and there's the prey. And when you go to work, what you have to do is you just have to do the best that you can with the people that you have and the resources that are available to you. You are the caribou. Run. Run. That's all you can really do within the resources that you have. But when I go to work, when I show up at the hospital, I don't show up to let nature run its course. I don't look at somebody who's being predated upon by a bacteria and say, well, it's how nature intended it. Fuck the prime directive. <laughs> That's not why I came. And when I looked around at the world around me, I saw that things were better everywhere. Absolute poverty, down. Child labor, down. Under five mortality, down. Guinea worm, down. Teen births in the US, down. Homicide rates, down. US violent crime, down. Years of education, up. Global, global literacy, up. Why can't I be a part of making things better? Even if it is one by one. Wasn't it all of the people who came together, doctors and researchers and academics and everything like this, who made the world indeed a better place? So what happened? What happened? Why was that not even an option? Why did people at my academic committees, I'm an associate professor at university now, why did they mock me when I even suggested it? The Economist had it best. Researchers have become intellectual mercenaries for product teams. They're there to solve immediate needs. That's what we have become as an academy. That's what we have become as professors, as teachers. That's what we have become largely as societies. But I wanted to do something different, and so did the people who I worked with. I had the luxury of being in a first world institution. Why not use it? I looked around, and when I looked around, I noticed that the things that were most in demand were the things that were least significant to so many more doctors. So I'm going to play a little game with you here with a piece of medical equipment that's critically important and is hard to find. All of the footage that you're going to see is from the war in 2014 where stethoscopes were in deep, deep shortage.
In 2014, we were literally smuggling stethoscopes while in other parts of the world, people were realizing that you could make 3D printers with 3D printers. And so that's the project that we started. After the war, we smuggled our first 3D printer. We used it to build other 3D printers. Those of you who print will recognize these as the Prusa i3s, um, which are, of course, self-replicating to a large extent. They use wooden frames because aluminum is very hard to find. Uh, and generally, if you work aluminum, it's going to probably end badly for you. We produced our first stethoscope head. It sucked. We produced many more. We finally ended up settling on something that worked. And then we studied it, validated it, and published it. This graph here with the red uh, R model and the black, the premium brand model for $300, ours costs about $3 shows that ours works at least as well. The parts where the red is lower than the black, that's where ours works even better. We decided to move on to a few other things. We worked on a pulse oximeter, which has been in progress for a few years and has finally now come to a prototype that's going to be clinically validated. And then we landed on the tourniquet. This is the very first tourniquet that was printed. I know. I know, the print orientation and all of that. We iterated, we worked on it, and at a certain point we realized that the war we were planning for, the war we were trying to get ready for, was going to come much sooner than we anticipated in the form of the protests that would start in March. This was the coordination of a bunch of things, one of them being the annual protests that Palestinians have to commemorate what they call their day of catastrophe, what the Israelis call their, uh, the day of the founding of the State of Israel. And this coincided with, of course, um, President Trump moving the embassy and a few other things coming together to ensure that it would be bad. We did trainings, of course. That was the most important. And we started printing tourniquets. This is one of the, the trainings with one of the senior physicians. And uh, when, we, when we started to do the trainings, we, started that we, had some, we realized that we had some problems with the tourniquet. We still did our best in the field to work with these tourniquets and try to be ready. You can see there a makeshift tourniquet. We ended up having to do trainings in the field. We ended up having to make tourniquets in the field. We could not print enough. 3D printing is not a mass manufacturing technology, and that's exactly what we had to use it as. Uh, because there is no such thing as injection molding out there. Any factory that is too big or looks too big gets bombed, and that's always a problem that we have. You can see here we're doing what's called JITT, just-in-time training, um, so that we could get some of the paramedics who weren't part of our, our paramedic training uh, up to speed on how to use the tourniquets. We would distribute them, and then we would try to make sure that, that they made it to the people who needed to have them. These are the statistics up until today. 18,000 people have been wounded in Gaza. This is on a population base of 2 million. 10,000 are what are called casualties without gas inhalation, 10,416 here. This is a couple of weeks old, these stats. And almost 60%, 56.3% are the legs. People get shot in the legs at a disproportionately high rate. These are people who die from limb exsanguination. These are the people who benefit the most from the tourniquet. This is a boy who was shot in the leg. If that leg is not controlled in terms of its bleeding, he will die. He needs a tourniquet somewhere above the injury, like, say, there. The person who's carrying him is a civilian. You can tell by his clothing. He has no medical training, nor is he expected to. He's going to hand off this boy to somebody else who does. As far as I know, the boy did not die. On May the 11th, we were finally ready for the first mass deployment of the tourniquet, and so we uh, deployed about 60 units. These units were not ready. About half of them were an older version that we knew had a problem. I decided to deploy them because I thought something is better than nothing. 
I was wrong, I'll explain why in a moment. This is a typical victim. His photo was taken May 11th. Um, he's shot in the left leg, and as you can see, his ankle shouldn't really be going in that direction. He will lose that ankle. That ankle is going to end up amputated. Just the, the injury pattern is such that he's not going to keep it. But he doesn't need to die. And he will die if he doesn't get tourniqueted. He was one of the, the people, the victims that I tourniqueted. Very quickly, we ended up with some failures. This is a photo from one of the failed tourniquet uh, deployments. I put this tourniquet on myself. Uh, the tourniquet broke. This gentleman has a high up injury. That other guy had an ankle injury that usually gives you time. This guy has a high up injury. These do not give you time. He, he will die if it's not tourniqueted properly. And so you can see the white there is my rescue tourniquet that I made from an improvised uh, cloth. Why did that happen? Before we ended up going to, to the field, we realized that our tourniquets were breaking. We were using um, basically nylon. However, with enough turns, we would end up breaking them. And to tell somebody who is in the middle of a field, being gassed, being shot at, running, literally, these were the three scenarios in which I was usually deploying these tourniquets, that they can't turn it too many times. I mean, it doesn't work. This is all it took to go from a broken one. This one was recovered from a patient where we lost the tourniquet. Um, and this is the new revised model right here. All the, that's different here is that this is curved, so it doesn't cut into the nylon and literally act to cut it. This photo was also taken on May the 11th. And it shows some of the costs of doing this kind of work. On the leftmost, um, you can kind of see half of him is a paramedic named Hamad Maqdad. I'm here. These are actually green, but doesn't really show as green in the photo. Uh, this is Musa. And then the photographer's name is Mu'min. This is Muhammad Maqdad. He was shot. On the left is Mu'min. He was shot. On the right is Musa Abu Hassanin. He was shot. This is Musa Abu Hassanin as he's dying. He was shot in the chest. We lost uh, a lot of patients that day because our medical teams just weren't able to deploy the gear as they were supposed to. And what we realized is that getting the best 3D printers, getting the best technology possible would never be enough. It would never counter what it was that that we were dealing with because fundamentally it is not a medical or a technical problem, though we try to do our best with it as such in those terms and that frame of reference. This is another typical scenario. These are the towers from which we were being shot. There are three of them. This is the location where I was. I was also shot on this uh, site as well, uh, in the legs as well. And as you can see, there are paramedics, all sort of brightly marked, um, some of the official ones and some not. Here he is being carried off. And as you can see, he's now being carried by civilians since the paramedics were in such short supply. 19 of us were shot that day that uh, that we couldn't spare more than one paramedic per rescue. So that, in short, is a long, chaotic, uh, slightly paradoxical tour of how we developed a, uh, our tourniquet and how we deployed it, the problems that we ran into. The problems were technical, of course. We literally had to figure out how to print it. We literally had to figure out how to fix it. We literally had to figure out why it was going wrong. But there were other things as well, like how do you deploy when your hands are full of blood? How do you deploy with one hand? How do you deploy while you're running? These are things that we really couldn't have thought of while we were sitting there in a quiet room pulling a tourniquet on our own legs. And so I guess it comes back down to that intimacy, uh, that closeness. And 
that sniper who is sort of looking. And the way that I've started thinking about this problem is that the good and the bad, all of it put together, it has to happen intimately, has to happen personally, has to happen one-on-one. -on -one. And so the question is, when there are so many people who are able and willing to take aim and to pull the trigger to destroy something, what is it that we are willing to take aim at? to hold our breath and to decide something that we can do to undo that or to make something that's better, that's more beautiful, that's more capable, that not only undoes some of the damage that other people do, but that prevents it from happening or creates a society in which it can't happen. Because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter how many tourniquets we're finally able to make. So long as there are people who are getting gunned down, then already we've lost. Already it hasn't worked. Already it means basically nothing because the cost is too high. So thank you very much. I want to end with some video that a friend took a few days ago. This is also Gaza. Fucking beautiful place full of tragedy, but like all of these places, full of so much beauty too. Thank you very much. <laughs>